Hey guys, Matt from Pomelo Pictures here and we are back with part two of our video where I'm talking to Radical Reggie about um, collecting games both here in the UK and Europe and over in the US as well. Um, Reggie, we, just as we were finishing part one of the video, we were kind of talking a little bit about how Nintendo and Sega tended to do things quite differently. Right. And that was something that was really obvious um, back in the 90s because I, 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 I don't know if you know, but it's like a little back history. Um, the NES generally bombed in Europe, particularly yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, firstly, we never had a video game crash. Um, I think a lot of people in the US that grew up in the 90s look at the NES as like the savior of video games. And, and, and in a way it was, but like particularly in Europe but in, and in the UK, we'd sort of grown up more with computer games. So like the Amiga, Commodore the Commodore, the Atari ST, which was my, my first console. Nice. <laughs> um, the ZX Spectrum, um, okay. all these games were kind of, they, they boomed in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And games that were coming out on the NES were like £50, which is probably at that point about $75. Jeez. Whereas the same games, the, well, not the same games, but kind of ports of the same games, you could get on a cassette tape for 50 pence, which is like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's what, what 25 cents i don't know what the conver conversion rate back then was but people kind of looked at the nes as like what is this thing but also nintendo didn't distribute it over here it was distributed by mattel um really and they just didn't know what to do with it whatsoever they they were like putting it in like you could buy the games in like drugstores and things really so <laughs> so people were just like what is it? and it was just a complete bomb until um, they actually packed in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is not a Nintendo game. It was a com developed by somebody else, and that's when it kind of started to sell, start to pick up. But because of that, it meant that like Sega was able to sort of get in there and become the console that everybody had. It it, it really you know it, when it comes to that, it really depends on who they hire for marketing for those for those uh, type systems. Like uh, here's an example, like a. Uh, uh, Sega uh, wasn't going to, I mean, during the time when the Sega Genesis first came out in America, they didn't yeah. know how to market it either. Uh, they yeah. had they packed it with Ultra Beast, you know. Now, that's mm. not going to be a game that's going to pick people up, right? No. So they hired a guy. I can't remember what his name was. But uh, he told them, he said, Let, hey, let's uh, pack this system with Sonic the Hedgehog. You know, yeah. Sega thought he was crazy for doing that. But they yeah. went through with it, and guess what happened? It was the best decision they made, you know. Because they didn't and, want to give away the killer app for free. Yeah, you gotta give it. You gotta get people picking up. The, that is the main game that people wanted for the system. Sonic Hedgehog, <laughs> fast, colorful, awesome. Yeah. You buy Genesis, you get that game. Uh, they now, when it comes to like a uh, Nintendo marketing in the UK, I mean, they could have did something similar to that, but you know, it yeah. depends on who they hired to do the marketing. You know. Yeah. I mean, because. Uh, Really, they're not going to be doing the marketing. They're going to have somebody else do it because they're only the only familiar uh, place that they're they're used to doing marketing is is their homeland, which is yeah. most of these systems are made in Japan. So uh, yeah. outside, they're like, well, how do we get people to want this stuff? You know? Yeah, and ev eventually they they had to take it over because it was selling so badly, and you mm -hmm. know they had to. Check. But what one of the other things that was really bad was that um, I mean, in in the U.S., obviously the Famicom and the uh, and the NES were completely different consoles, mm -hmm. technically speaking, but they were still both NTSC. So you could import um, a, a Famicom if you wanted to. Yep. Here, here in the UK, um, I, I've, I've got a cartridge here as well. Um, it's a, I don't know if I'll hold it up to the camera for you, so you can see. It's got a little A on it. Mm -hmm. That was for uh, because we had PAL A and PAL B. So like we couldn't import games even from Europe for the NES because of the region locking, even though they were both PAL. Yeah. So like. Um, I mean, to put it into perspective, like I could drive to France in two hours, but I couldn't buy games there and bring them over. Because, mm -hmm. uh, with some consoles, I could, but not with NES because that one would be region locked. Region so it's kind of like we we were really locked in on this little island of just only games that we could get. Yeah, and that, and that killed it for you guys. You know, like region locking is one of the worst things they could ever do to anybody. You know. Yeah. I was so happy when the PS3 wasn't region was region free. You know, yeah. what I mean, region free is. One of the best things I feel you could do for a system, you, you, you're giving people a choice because a lot of publishers don't want to release their games in America because they're too expensive and they figure they can mm. make more money in, the, in their country. But even even if you want that game, you can still buy it and play it on your system. You know? yeah. I mean, they were just really, I don't know what Nintendo was thinking back then, man. I, they just, 
I feel like they killed it for the UK, you know, any interest yeah. by having all that, those restrictions. Well, because I, I remember watching a video, I think it was Happy Console Game, and they were talking about when the, the Super Famicom first came out, because that was a little bit before the US got the, the sort of more bulky Super Nintendo. Right, right. And they would import Super Famicoms over, and obviously it would just play on American TVs, because they're NTSC. Yeah. But when, when it's PAL, you kind of you have to wait for that European version. And then when they split Europe out into A and B, it's just sort of just completely kills it. Yeah, seriously. I mean, I <laughs> back in the day when I first uh, when I first got my PAL PS2, because there was a game I wanted to play really bad. It was Forbidden Forbidden Siren 2, which the only English version came out in the UK. Yeah. And uh, I got a PAL uh, PS2, and I thought it was just going to be as simple as this plugging in the wall and, and playing the game on a TV. Uh, first of all, I had to get a convert power converter to have yeah. the right power going for it to turn the system on. And then when I got the TV, when I turned on the TV, I had to have some kind of like a, a co- splitter or converter to make change it, the frequency. The yeah. I, 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 by that time I got so frustrated. I was like, forget it. You know, I'm done. This <laughs> shouldn't be this hard. And I gave up on it. Uh, luckily years later, I was able to find a test PS2 system. Oh, sorry about it. Someone with a motorcycle. Yeah, that's not bike. Uh, and I got a test PS2 system, which is, is a region-free PS2 system. Yeah. And I was able to play a lot of those games without, without the, the power, uh, without having to have a, a power converter for it. But you have to have mm. the right television, though. But yeah, 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 definitely. There's a lot of stress uh, release by having mm. that system. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the thing. It's, I mean, it's not just the fact that certain games were only released in certain areas. There's... Like, so, but, but because, like, Japan, US, Europe all have different sort of rules on censorship as well, or, yeah. censorship or whatever you want to call it, that some of the games were just completely different. So, for example, like, Contra. We never got Contra. Um, we did get a version of it. Um, I forget the name Call of it. Called Robo because, something. Or well, nothing. there was Probotector, but Probotector. then there was, a, there, was like, there was an arcade version, which was basically Contra, but they changed the name. But I think it was something to do with... There's a law, there was a, a law in Germany... Um, that they couldn't, there was only sort of, you could only show a certain amount of violence towards humans mm-hmm. um, because obviously they, we don't need to go into it, but Germany has a checkered past with violence. Right, right. Um, so things were changed to be either robots or zombies. So it's got, so we had Pro Protector, which is basically Contra, but it had to be like Transformers style robots. Right, right. And there's no way of playing Contra, or at least. Obviously, now with like modern TVs, they can switch frequencies. But back in the day, there would be no way of playing Contra on an NES without having a US or Japanese TV. And with CRT TVs, there was you know there was no shipping a big heavy TV from the US over here. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like you're kind of restricted to what you got. And also things like um, just down to things like um, like the Contra had we like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We actually had I don't know if you can see on the camera Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. No, oh, yeah, because Ninja was like, uh, I forgot there was the, that, that word, I, I remember. Yeah, There's, there was all sorts of things, like, um, we couldn't, yeah, you, you couldn't have the word Ninja, he couldn't have Nunchucks, and uh, they had to remove some of the words like Bummer in it, because that's kind of a colloquialism for being gay, so wow. we had to have all these different things. So, sort of, you have these different versions, so we had this Palais version, and that was just for us, no one else had this, and it's just kind of like... <laughs> It's kind of like, okay, they can have this version and the rest of the world can have the other one. Wow. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, so going back to the Teenage Mutant, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, I remember uh, uh, going on YouTube and I heard I, actually, I, I heard it, I, I heard it by accident, but the intro song yeah. of Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Yeah, the, the intro music, yeah. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> Hero Turtles. That's not the name of it, but it was hilarious like hearing it. It still sounded cool, but it was just like, whoa, it's... It's really different, you know? yeah. <laughs> so it's and it's it's a bit it's a it's a bit weird. If it's a, it was it was the same going the other way. Like if you'd grown up with hearing Hero and then suddenly hit Ninja, it was, yeah, it's, it's yeah. You're like, different. what the what the heck? You know, what's going on? But yeah. Uh... <laughs> but but uh, in terms of um, in terms of import gaming, like, are you a guy that kind of imports from Japan, the Europe? anywhere or do you kind of try and stick to u.s versions or no way uh if you stick to the u.s you're if you stick to only your region you're going to be you're limited you're limiting yourself yeah. i do not want to limit my collection i branch all out and i really started doing it back in late 2014 early 2015 uh with i started with pal games first because mm. uh pal my one of my friends drew he introduced a game to me called uh, chaos break 
he knows I love survival horror games. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They're just great. And Chaos Break was a uh, the English version was released in the UK. Japanese version was released in Japan. Uh, even though the game's English voice acting, uh, dialogue and uh, notes are in yeah, Japanese yeah. and English, depending on where it's at. So I bought that game, and I was like, oh, I fell in love with it immediately. And I was like, what else does the UK have that I don't know about? Yeah. And I started doing research, and I found out a bunch of games which I have in my collection here. I mean, yeah. I love both. I, I'm more of a, I think I'm more of a UK guy, but the, being a UK guy, I feel like you have to be you have to have the pr- right setup if you want your games yeah. to play properly. So you have to be yeah. aware of that right television, right power, or whatever. Yeah. But I'm I'm interested in a lot of uh, PAL games. Definitely. Yeah. Actually, actually talking to you now, I can see some of the, like the difference between behind you, the difference between the US and the uh, European PS1 yeah, yeah. boxes. Because we have these are like white covers in the back. You know, yeah, and we have these big bulky boxes. But the thing is, it's because um, it's the manuals. Like with the US versions of PlayStation One games, generally speaking, the the manual was the was like the the front cover, the box. Mm-hmm. But because with us, we tend to have like multiple languages on the discs. Like, yes. And you see it with some Game Boy Advance games. Like I, I've got the US and the UK, or the US and the European versions of some games, and they're basically exactly the same. But the European version has a language select at the beginning. Yep. So it meant right that. In the beginning, yep. So it meant that the manuals had to have every language in it as well. So that's why that's why our boxes are so bulky for anyone who hasn't noticed. And you know, uh, people say that they don't like them because they they can break easily or everything. But the thing about it, it, it with our PS One games, if you yeah. lose the manual, the game has no cover to it, and it decreases yeah. the value greatly. If you lose the manual in one of your books, it doesn't decrease that much. You know what I mean? No, like it no. still has the cover. It still looks presentable yeah. and uniform. So. Yeah, the only thing the only thing was, yeah, they do break easily, like you can yeah. see, because they're bulky, but also they're not the best plastic in the world. Right, anyway. right. I, I actually probably need to find some replacement ones on eBay or something to have them sent to me just as backups, because, you know, I, I cracked a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a good collecting tip, because if, if you try and buy the cases for these just themselves, they're really expensive. Yeah. The best way to do it, buy really cheap sports games. If you can find a sports game in good condition. They're, exactly. Very yeah. smart. Buy the sports game and switch it out like that. <laughs> Which is actually actually going on. That's that's a thing um, that is a big difference between the, the two main regions as well. I mean, I'm not a big sports game guy, but one thing that, like, over here you will not see... Well, you, you do see them, but not very often. But you don't see Madden. You don't see NBA games. You don't see a lot of baseball games. For us, the big one is FIFA. Like, that's FIFA. the one that's over. I mean, I know you guys have FIFA in the US, but, like, yeah, with things like it, Madden not is not a top sport. selling game. The most popular sport here, I'm guessing, is, is football, uh, basketball, and baseball. You know, yeah. soccer, FIFA seems to be like more of the, um, probably like the fourth or fifth popular sport. But over in the UK, it's like number one, right? Definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, like, you won't pay a lot. The, the weird thing is that you, the, the older versions of the games, cost nothing like sometimes they, they're giving them away like if you buy a game you they'll throw in a copy of a copy FIFA from free. a few years but then the new one comes out and it's it's like the equivalent of what 60 dollars or something whereas the one from the year before is like already 60 percent off but it's the right. it's weird that with sports games they couldn't they kind of have the ability to make sure that the latest version is the one that people want even though it's not that different to the one yeah. From a few from a year ago, it's it, it, it's crazy. That's another way people are are crazy. You know, like uh, they release these games every. A, a sports game is crazy because it's expensive the first three four months, but then yeah, you know, uh, it goes down because the new one they're already working on the new one coming out, and you know, what is it? Just an upgraded wa- roster, a couple of different gimmicks or whatever. It's just it's really weird how people haven't got past that slump yet, where no. they don't need to buy a new sports game every year. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, <laughs> which is which is which was one thing amazing working at um, Sega because you got to watch because one of the things they had was Football Manager, and the game is basically the same every year, mm-hmm. but they nailed the the skill of just tweaking it just enough. Just just enough. People just and just enough. The the game is pretty much the same, um, but they just just managed to tweak that one little bit. They go, oh okay, now I'll spend an extra twenty pounds on it. I mean, could you imagine buying that type of game every year? If you were in it, you know what I mean? It would, I think it would start to get, like, I don't know, like, diminish itself, you know? Like, uh, like Call of Duty, you know? Hmm. A lot of people play Call of Duty, and they come out every year, 
And uh, most people play it for the multiplayer. I play it for the story, both multiplayer. Yeah. I, I try to get the most out of it. But every year, it, it kind of waters itself down no matter what. You know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're, it's just really weird. And I think finally... There's only so many jumps in quality that they can do. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, man, you know, like every year, you don't need to bring out the same title every year. And I would think a developer, when they're bringing out a title every year, wouldn't they get tired of that? I think most mm. developers want to create new stuff instead of creating sequels or, you know, stuff like that to other games, you know? Yeah, I think that's a good point because, I mean, um, I mean, I, I met a few of the guys from EA over here and you start talking about what they've got going and it's just FIFA. And I think they get a bit fed up with it because... Of, a lot of the time, they're gamers first. They're not sports fans. Um, so the fact that they're big seller and something that EA pushes more than anything in this country particularly is a sports game, it gets a little bit depressing for them where yeah. there's guys in the industry that are working on all these different all these different genres of games, all these different, uh, different IPs, and it's just FIFA, 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 and then topped up a bit with Madden. <laughs> Good old Madden, golly. Yeah. Uh, Madden was a game over here. Oh, man, like, people were pumped to see that game. It, like They're, like, pumped to see that, like, new uh, Michael Jordan shoes coming out every year. It was just insane. But uh, I never really got into the, the football games or sports games. I mean, I, I do like some of them, but they have to be yeah. arcade-like, like something you got hop into and get right out of, not where you have to play a season, stuff like that. No. I, I'd rather just – like, NBA – you know, And that. those are the ones that keep their value because – you can play them now and they're just as fun as they were when exactly. they were released. Exactly. You know, so that's what's cool about those type of sports games. So people should. In fact, that's, that's one thing I, I, I sort of, I don't I wouldn't say I necessarily collect them, but things like Mario Tennis and Mario Golf. I'm not a big tennis or golf fan, mm-hmm. but whenever, whenever there's one of those, I, I, I won't buy it new, but it's always on my, okay, at one point I'll get that one because mm-hmm. you, like you can go back to, you know, the NES versions and things, and they're still fun to play. The right. Game Boy versions are still fun to play. Those those games are really actually the sports games you want to play. Like Mario Golf on the GameCube, oh my god, that game is so much fun. N64 version, I mean, those are well done. Those are games like that are uh, made to be fun. Not hard. Yeah. Like everybody could get into them. That's what I and like. You don't need to be. You don't games. have. You don't need to have an interest in golf at, at all, all to play them. At all, which is awesome. You know, uh, Nintendo actually has done well making sports games fun. So I got a couple <laughs> I'm looking at right now, but yeah. So for you at the moment, what's kind of what's your focus? Is it survival horrors? Is it what? What's your? Well, right now, I, right now, I feel like I'm in the twilight days of my collecting. Uh, uh, as far as going back, uh, collecting like more like retro games. I, I'm always looking for PlayStation One stuff uh, because that's my favorite system of all time. Yeah. I like finding stuff for that. Uh, import wise uk you know mostly and japan as well but right now what my collection is focusing on is mostly uh playstation 4 stuff and vita games i'm, I'm looking at mm-hmm. the new modern games that are coming out today uh, even if they're indie titles you know what i mean like here's a title right here a lot of people don't know about hopefully i don't knock this stat down Whew, that was close that was uh, you did it too dark stuff like this is what I'm looking for. This is an indie game came out for PS4. Ah, I know that. It's, yeah, yeah, it was an indie game, but it, yeah, yeah, I know that one, yeah. Yeah, it's made from the creators of Alone in the Dark. Stuff like this is what I'm looking for for the PS4. I love this type mm. of stuff. The PS4 is really reminds me of the days of the PS1, and I am really enjoying it because you get you can get modern games and you can get indie type retro games, you know, on the system. You know, people are still yeah. creating this stuff, so... Uh, I mean, most... I guess that goes, but that goes back to what we were saying in part one: is that you sort of you need to know when to collect, and those are the games that are going to be what people are looking for in a few years' time. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's still new prices at the moment, but mm-hmm. eventually they're probably going to be. Now would be the time to buy them. Like the the same with like the like the Shantae games. Oh, um, oh yeah. They're like. They're not that cheap now, but they're only going to get more. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I think Shante for the new one, uh, Half Genie Hero, uh, sold out on Amazon uh, for Vita and the PS4. So now people are, are jumping the price up already. And the price for that one is because it's, a, it's a really a complete package because it comes with a soundtrack as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you get a soundtrack CD in there as well. So, yeah, that game's going to go up. And who knows what it'll be in the future. I'm just happy I got my copy. So I don't have to worry <laughs> about it. But yeah. but that's that's actually a good point because that's kind of one thing that 
goes with the territory of collecting these days is that a lot of people will buy to sell. Like they will buy just to put it on eBay. You, um, if you, if you, not to interrupt you, but if you do that, if you're buying to sell, you can't do it immediately. You have to sit mm-hmm. on that game. You know what I mean? People, that's the mistake that a lot of resellers are. I won't say resellers in general, but scalpers do. You yeah. know, they want to buy the game and then resell it immediately and try to triple, double their money. You got to wait till that game becomes in demand before people will buy it because you'll be sitting on it for who knows how long yeah. you'll be sitting on it unless some guy just has a bunch of money to spend on what you're asking for. You, you yeah. have to... And w- we really saw that with like the NES Classic over here because, um, I mean, first of all, we, I mean, we don't need to go into how badly Nintendo handled yeah. it, but um, <laughs> like we, over here, we because um, we don't have GameStop, our big store is Game, but they don't tend to sell that kind of things. So we have a, we have a, uh, a store called CEX, which is kind of like um, it's kind of like a uh, not exactly a pawn shop, but like secondhand electronics, DVDs, games, and things. And you could walk into one of those now, and they'd have like five in the window. But it's because they, they'd get them in and they immediately overprice them. And people were just like, I can't afford to pay that. So w- one thing that's weird is within the space of like a month, it's gone down like nearly 40% in price mm-hmm. because like there was obviously that rush at Christmas when everybody was trying to get one. Yeah. But <laughs> now every, nobody's willing to spend that much. Yeah, the, the Christmas a bug it has everybody acting crazy. And who, mm. you know, they, they, that's when they, lots of when they, a lot of those people prey on those, those folks that want those games to, to, for their kid or impress their girlfriend or whatever, you know what I mean? So it, it sucks, but. I saw controllers for over a hundred dollars, just the, the, the spare controller. It's, it's a ridiculous. spare controller alone. And, you know, uh, honestly, a lot of people don't realize that they could just use a Wii controller in that extra slot, you know what I mean? Instead of buying that, yeah. but everybody wants to feel cool by having an extra controller and everything like that, you know, uh, I actually got my, well, not to, not to go off topic too much, but, you know, I actually got my NES Classic by chance because my buddy had an extra one and he sold yeah. it to me. And uh, I opened that sucker up and I tried to play it. And I was like, why did I even get this thing? I, I just I have no desire to play it. <laughs> well, that's why, while everyone was buying an NES Classic, I, I, like, I had, like, NES games, but I didn't have a working NES. But when everyone was buying the NES Classic, that's when I went out to, like, our local retro store and I bought an old-school NES because I was like, okay, well, that's... If everyone's buying the, the remake version, I'll go get the original instead. Right. And quite honestly, I, I, st- I prefer playing it on the original. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, I mean, the good thing about the NES Classic, I guess you're, you, you play on modern TVs, you get the, yeah. the HD quality and all that stuff and then if you want to you can mod it and just put your personal favorite games on the system that's what i figure mm. people people would do to own it not have every game like a lot of people do with those types of no, systems no, like no. with every game put the games you want on the system so yeah. the system is to in your image only you know mm. what i mean like your nes classic has the games yeah. you love as a kid and makes it really worth it to yeah. you you know what i mean so, although to be honest I, I mean i don't i don't know if i'm the only one i guess but i don't really like the look of sort of um, eight-bit graphics or sixteen-bit graphics on a modern TV. Not just even like even with um, even with like a, a a scaler where the the pixels are made. Right. I like the look of it with the scan lines, and that's the one thing that always annoyed me about uh, emulators is that um, it just didn't look good. Whereas now with emulators, you know, you can they can fake the scan lines and things. But that was one thing that I always liked about having the the actual physical game rather than just emulating it is because it just it looks better on with yeah the, yeah the, I totally and it feels you. better with the right controller as well yeah I, i've been one of those guys that kind of like i didn't like it but i i just learned to accept it but i i totally mm. feel the same way you do about it you know uh uh i feel like old school retro games should just they just look better on old school tcr crt tel- televisions you know instead of like uh big screen hd televisions it just doesn't feel right in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so um, what would you say, like right now, is probably your most prized possession in your in your collection? my collection? Yeah. Oh, this because is I, the thing is, I've seen your game room tour, and I know what my favorite thing is in your collection. Oh, you but tell I'll me let you answer. Yeah. Favorite item in my collection. Uh, I'm gonna. This is. I might be cheating by showing this, but this was a gift from a fan, a fan and friend. Uh, he made a box for me of my favorite PS2 game, and that is a Steambot Chronicles. He made this box. Oh for wow! Me. Is that is that like burnt wood? Yes, yeah, burned wood. And, wow. Uh, he uh, what he 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 designed it. He put my picture on it on the back of Reggie's <laughs> favorite game. And uh, what I did with the box was uh, I put Steam, every game related to Steambox Chronicles. 
I put yeah. in this box. So uh, where whether it was pre-orders like here's the demo disc for the for the game because that's pretty all right. Cool so your well. whole your whole collection for the game is in there. Yeah, it was supposed to be a sequel to come out for it, but it never did. It they had a semi sequel. So here's a spinoff game called a uh, 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 Blockus Blocus. It's yeah. like a block game with the Steambot Chronicles characters, and uh, there's a PSP game which is a semi sequel to Steambot Chronicles, yeah. which is awesome. And then uh, here, Steambot Chronicles uh, uh, Harmonica, which was a pre order bonus for the game. Harmonica. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I actually had one. I opened one of them and it broke, and uh, oh, I got right. some play out of it. And here's the game, yeah, of yeah. course. And uh, yeah. this is my favorite game out of, out of all my games. I love this game. Uh, so. When he found that out, he made the box for me, and the rest is history. I mean, yeah, that, this is my favorite item out of my collection, uh, hands down. Uh, I love it, man. It's just awesome. And he really... <laughs> for me, it's for me, it's kind of um, like my the the favorite things in my collection are not necessarily my favorite games. Like, I've, right, uh, it's, it's it's up there at the moment. I can't get it at the moment, but I've got a. Um, the game is not good whatsoever. It's 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 Mighty Morphin Power Rangers for the Game Boy. It's an awful game, but um, I I loved the TV show when I was a kid, and Me I've too. got a sealed sealed copy of the Game Boy game. Oh. And at, at Comic Con, I got it signed by the original Red, Blue, and Black Ranger. Oh, nice! So it's not it's not a good game whatsoever, but, yeah, but those it's kind of like that. You know what I mean? Like exactly. Yeah. That's and that's kind of that's a little bit like with your thing. That's one thing I'd never sell. Um, like I have things that are worth more, but I don't necessarily have the emotional attachment to them. Right. Um, right. But in terms of games that I do really love, but also are expensive, there's one in your collection that I really Is like, it? and that, I don't know if you still got it, but you, I saw you had a, a boxed version of Trip World on the Game Boy. Oh yeah. That, oh, I think I saw your comment that you, your comment of it, like when you made a comment <laughs> that, about it. And, and, that and, when and, you yeah. put that. The, the, my the first thing I put over was jealous of that of the Trip World cartridge because that is one that's really hard to find over here. I don't know if it is in the U.S. as well. Yeah, definitely. It was lucky I looked at it. Pete Door, uh, another yeah, YouTuber, yeah. had talked about the game. Said he had paid a hundred bucks for it a while ago. So I looked into it. I was like, man, this game looks pretty cool, actually. That's it's not tough. a bad price for it. Huh? No, not that's it. not a bad price for it. And this was back in and this was back in 2012 or 2013 when he had the video mm. for it. So yeah, that's actually a good price for it. Uh, but now, oh my God, you know, I, I, I I'm an admin in the Gameway group that my buddy Keith started, and uh, I've seen a couple of Trip Worlds go in there, and people were asking like 1,200 bucks for him. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. Uh, you it's buy crazy. If you, even if you spend a, over a hundred dollars for a game, you're gonna have buyers for more, no matter what. You know what I mean? I, so, I've seen. I've seen repros of Trip World for a hundred dollars. Just the serious? cartridge, yeah. Because people, because people sent this is this is a weird thing with reproductions. It's kind of like if people, if it's a rare game to begin with, and an expensive game, people think the repro should be expensive as well. It's kind of like, well, no, no, it's it it should it should be the same price as any other repro because yeah, most you can make as many are, of them you want. Are, are most repros, I think, you know, depending on who makes it and how they make it, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about Game Boy games, but like Super Nintendo games and stuff like that, because you have to do soldering and stuff like that. And they're probably worth yeah. like thirty to forty dollars, I guess, yeah. at the most between that yeah. pr price range. Uh, Game Boy games, I don't know how hard it is, but they should be. I think they should be less, maybe around fifteen yeah. to twenty. I don't makes... think there's as much soldering. Yeah. Yeah. But the yeah, thing is, there's yeah, not much I... uh, work to do. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm but not I mean, sure, that's. But yeah, but that's one thing. If people are going to get into buying repros, they should be careful. Obviously. That... Just because something's a rare and expensive game doesn't mean the the repro should be rare and, and expensive because they can make as many. You know, and that's where people need to draw the line. If you're buying a repro, don't think that you are you're selling a repro. Don't think that you could charge like hundreds of dollars for it if the games. You know, you're you're making a product available for somebody who just wants to have a physical copy of it. You know, what I mean, yeah. it's not the real thing, and it's yeah, it's as simple as and that. And it's so. not rare because people can make as many of them as they want. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, what here, here's a question for you. Do yeah. you think the repro community, community I mean, uh, do you think it's kind of destroying what's happening with games today? And when I say destroying, I'm, I'm talking about how people are making reproduction games of games who, that are already officially released, you know. Do you think this is a bad thing? I, I, I see what you mean. Um, it depends. I mean, it's kind of the same question as, like, with emulators, whether you think emulators are a bad thing or not. Personally, I, I think emulators are fine because you're kind of... Um, Oh, hang on one sec. My camera's just stopped. 
don't. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, it's just uh, for people for the purpose of people watching in Europe, we have this really annoying thing with DSLRs. You can only record up to half an hour, uh, and then you have to re uh, re record to try and protect the camcorder market. Doesn't happen in the US with the with this camera, but anyway, that's what we're, <laughs> we're talking about. <laughs> we're, we're not talking about the camera market. Um, yeah, with emulators and things. I mean. For a lot of people, that's how they got back into gaming. I mean, you were saying earlier that um, th what one of the things that got you into retro gaming was the Retron 5, and that is basically an emulator box. You have to have the cartridge, but <clears throat> it is still an emulator box. And I think also for a lot of people back in the day, um, I mean, because cartridge games are so expensive, um, a lot of the way they played the games with with bootleg multi-carts. But... It never, I, I wouldn't say it never really ruined the market, um, particularly with retro, because I mean, you can buy the NES Classic, you can buy, you can get emulators, you can get all these things, but a lot, there is still a, a scene for owning the original thing, the, the, the original. But right. where, it, where it gets a little bit um, shady for me is when people are. The, this, this, there was a thing recently where people were going into Wii U games and Switch games and somehow finding the content that's for amiibos that haven't been released yet oh. and they're putting them on nsc cards and so that's a little bit for me that's not that's not okay because you're sort of you're kind of counterfeiting things that haven't been released yet right and right. in the end i mean repros are counterfeits but if say for example someone could never get a copy of uh let's say little samson i mean that's a game that is expensive but it's also one that people really want to play right it's a fun game. Obviously, whoever owns the rights to those has the right to release like a classic collection or whatever it is with it in and get their money from it. But until they're doing that, if someone's playing it on a repro or a um, or an emulator, I'm not. I don't really see any problem with that as right. long as when when the company that owns the rights decides to re-release it or whatever they do it properly because then you want to own the official copy exactly um and, and I, i'm so i'm okay with it in that sense yeah that's cool and you know a lot of i think a lot of the companies haven't got involved in this yet you know a, a reproduction we've made of their games because there's not much money being made on it so they don't really care yeah. you know it's right in that gray area you know what i mean yeah. so uh, but if they, if, uh, if people were selling them all the time and they were making a lot of money, then I'm pretty sure they would like get involved, you know, somehow. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I don't see that happening. But uh, no. so. Uh, and the thing with I mean the thing with cartridges because they are so expensive, it doesn't make like financial sense for Nintendo or Sega or anything to start making cartridges again. Because a lot of the guys that make repros, um, I mean, it's quite expensive for them to do it. Um, yeah. Like the equipment that like John Riggs and things has is yep. is a lot of money. So. If anything, it's more for the love of it, and if if and if what they're using it for is more to do with like hacked games and things like you have your own you have your own Radical Reggie game and yeah. um, John Riggs does things like that. I mean, I don't see any problem with that, but yeah, generally speaking, if somebody's making a repro, they're not going to make a lot of money off it mm -mm. as long as they're not as, as they're not trying to trick people into thinking it's a rare repro, so to speak, and putting it, the price up, which was happening somewhat. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know if you, when GameStop was actually taking vintage games in for a while. Yeah, and this was a lot of time for like some people to like cash in on their repros, like as real yeah. copies of games. So yeah, 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 that happened to them, and because, it still does. But you know, because they weren't being checked as much. Yeah, they, I mean, they don't play their employees to care. They just plan to take whatever in, and then they'll figure it yeah. out later, which is terrible in my opinion. But uh, you know, uh, I, I just want to bring up the fact that when you're buying an expensive game, you always want to uh, make sure nowadays, make sure it's real if you're spending more than yeah. 40 to $50 for it. So I, I wanted to tell people to kind of like invest in bit tools. Uh, bit tools yeah. are the items you open up games with to see what they look like. If you're going out yeah. shopping and you see a game, you might want to just take a look at it, you know what I mean, see if it's a real copy. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, uh, Metal Jesus and Kelsey did a good video on that yes. where they, they mainly talked about Nintendo games, but it's the same for Sega or anything else. If somebody doesn't let you open it up, don't yeah. buy it. Get out of there. Seriously, yeah. because they should have no problem with letting you look at the game. I mean, if they have no. a problem and they something's not right, it's not legit, so yeah. be cautious of the, that. The, that's what, like, generally speaking, I won't buy, like, Game Boy Advance games off eBay or anything now because I've been burned before on it. But one of the things that's really hard to tell, um, like, 3DS, not so much with, like, DS games, because you can't open them up. There's a lot of bootleg like Pokemon games and things. Like I think I have one here. Oh wow! Um, so that, that is like, going on. 
Okay. Yeah, because like this this is a real box and a real cut because I bought the box and cartridge separately, but um, I I bought I got the cartridge. And um, it wasn't working properly, and I tried to open it up, but you really have to pry them open. Yeah. And like, and then you're you're basically gluing them back together, mm -hmm. um, which is fine if it's fake because you know it doesn't really matter if it's beaten up. But if you, if you go to the effort of like opening it up and then it turns out that it's real, you've ruined yeah. the cartridge, which is yeah. it's re which is really annoying for DS games. But you know, <laughs> but there, it does happen. There are. I mean, generally speaking, I think it's more the Pokemon games, but yeah, than anything else. Because Pokemon but, is the games that everybody—that's the big craze for uh, the, the DS and the 3DS uh, right yeah. now. So <laughs> yeah, and like particularly with like Game Boy Advance games, they're the ones to look at. But yeah, basically, like usually if it's like a sports game or you know a two-dollar game, like even things like Super Mario Brothers, because it, it's it's a game that everybody wants, but it's so common. Generally speaking, they're probably not going to be the ones that are being faked. It's yeah. the it's the expensive ones that and exactly. The, the a, a lot of the time you go, or... a lot of the time you'll go on eBay and they're it's a little bit suspect that they're, they're only selling rare games. And you're like, mm. yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> you know, uh, as far as the DS, I've been lucky uh, not to like find any bootleg games for the system. Yeah. Uh, but uh, just just like you were saying, be aware that the most popular games are are the ones that are, are most likely to just yeah. get, have a bootleg. So just be wary of that. You know, uh, I know one way back in the day, how was how I was able to tell a, a, a Game Boy Advance game was a repro was if you look inside the cartridge, they have the, they usually have this number imprint in there. And yeah, if it's not in there. They would tell me say it's pretty much a, a, a bootleg. Or the label, what didn't look right? You know what I mean? Like it was the paper or something like that. Yeah, so. the, the label, the labels actually. If you don't have the tools, the label's actually a really good one because on Game Boy Advances, I don't know if this is the same with the US, but there tends to be like a little number, like um, yeah, not right. in ink, but it's like um, indented in. in on inside, the label. That's, yeah, exactly what I was yeah. talking about. Like yeah. in, in inside, and that number is not in there. Uh, yeah. It's most likely not an official cartridge, so because uh, nobody would go to the effort of faking that. There's no. Yeah, it's, exactly. Like, it's just so. it's. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, I was, um, before we finish up, I was just going to talk about. I, I think I think you've t probably spoken about this on one of your other podcasts before. But in terms of like gaming, what are your like your pet peeves? Is, um, is it things like people selling repros, or is there things specifically that like my um, pet peeves? I would say people yeah. just buying sealed games and just, just just for the sake of just having a sealed game. Sealed games mm. annoys me because it's like, why would you buy something you're not going to open? Because you you have on your channel you have breaking the seal where you specifically you like you yeah, basically you get games, a seal game and then you break it yeah I, I open that sucker up because I buy it because I want to play it and a lot of things that people are doing today which is weird to me but it might not be weird to everybody but they'll buy a game and then they'll just download the regular one and play that one yeah you know what I mean that's just you're just wasting money I mean obviously yeah. if you want to have sealed games and sell them in the future but do you know how hard it is to sell some sealed games to people people don't yeah. care about it, that. So, it's I mean, not, not everybody. It's not an investment. You can make more more money investing in anything else than games. Yeah, seriously. Thank you very much. I mean, games are probably <laughs> the least you can make a lot yeah. of money in. But, uh, but what about things? Um, what about things like? Um, are you because you'd mentioned things like if you lose the manual for PlayStation One, you've lost the front cover as well. Is there anything else like that? Uh, like... Yeah, that bugs me because you, you don't have the cover for it. That's why I collect a lot of my games. They have to be complete for PS One, and Jason's the same way. I just. I want my game to have. Uh, I just, I just want it to be complete. That's just, yeah, that's a pet peeve definitely for P for CD mm. based games. They must be complete. Cartridge games I could deal with when not without having a cover yeah. because cartridge just feels like it, it's just fine like that. You know what I mean? But yeah, CD based the games have to have covers. The only thing with cartridges for me is, I mean, everybody knows like with N sixty four, like there's no end labels and things. So if you that just sucks. put them on a shelf, I... but also we in the in the in the, in Europe, the, the, our Super Nintendo games are the same as the Super Famicom, which have no end labels too. Mm -hmm. So, like for two generations, and also the thing with um, the thing with N sixty four, at least they're flat. These ones, I don't know if you can see on the camera, they're curved. Mm -hmm. So you can't stack them either because they so sort of they, 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 they so. roll about on each other. So it's kind of like if you want to collect Super Nintendo, I've, like my Super Nintendo game boys, games are in a box because if I try and put them on the shelf, firstly I can't see what they are. And they're all they all sort of sway because they're all curved as well. You know, you know what I can recommend for that is what I did. I mean, just I I make custom cases for my Super Nintendo games because yeah. you know, like uh, I put them in clamshell cases, and I'll show you what one looks like here. 
So I got Final Fight three here and everything like yeah. that. Now, just in case it had your uh, like your that weird like how yeah, yours yeah. Are, are, are shaped. This fits any kind of cartridge: Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, Super Famicom, oh, right, yeah. in there perfectly. And I have this custom case like this, and it, and yeah. it makes it more uniform. So that's what I would recommend for you mm. if you want. If you want the to only make... thing, the only thing then is the endless problem: space and where to store space, it. Space, yeah, and kill space. <laughs> And luckily, I was get I was I was lucky enough to get all my Super Nintendo games on that rack over here. But yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> so, <laughs> gosh. Basically. But anyway, I guess I think that's probably about it for this video. Reggie, thank you so much for talking hey, no with problem. us. Um, uh, We'll put links to, in both videos and where to subscribe to your channel, to mine. Uh, thank you guys all for watching, and uh, we'll see you all very soon. A big thank you from me and from Reggie. If you haven't seen part one yet, you can catch it over on my channel. There should be a link in the description. Uh, please like and subscribe both of our channels, and hopefully we can do more of these videos in the future. I definitely have a better understanding of how to make cross-continent live chats work better next time. Thanks again to Reggie for the chat, and here's to the next one.